Father, as we continue to explore the issue of world views, and as we look at the powerful, sometimes seemingly all controlling, and yet we know it's not psychological world view that has ensnared so many people and so many young people, I pray that you would help me to elucidate the facts of the matter for those gathered here today, that they might walk in ways that are pleasing to you and avoid the traps of modern man and his brazen autonomy. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. As I mentioned last night, I grew up in a Jewish home. What I didn't mention last night was that I had a very, very strong Jewish mother who came from the old country. In this case, it was Russia. And I'll just tell you a few things about my mother. In 1917, during the pogroms in Russia, her, several in her family, there were 13 brothers and sisters, several of them were slaughtered during the pogroms. And my mother was spared because her father, I am told, a rabbi in the community, took the Tanakh, the Old Testament scrolls, and she was a, a baby and covered her with them. And an older sister who survived told me that this was how my mother was saved as a baby by the word of God. And uh, amazingly, she was saved at the very end of her life once again, by the word of God, she was saved and converted to faith in Christ just before she died. In between that time, I came on the scene, and one of the things my mother very strongly desired for me was that I would become a lawyer, and uh, not just a lawyer, but a tax lawyer. <laughs> Let me say... This was her desire, although I hated numbers. I hated anything to do with this kind of thing. But I, I tried to be a dutiful son. And I, when I was in university in New York City, at the City University of New York, I was studying accounting. And I had a year-long course that I had to pass the whole year off. You had to take the whole year over again. And I was failing this course in accounting miserably. And my professor, who was a tax lawyer with a PhD in economics, my mother's dream, <laughs> uh, Dr. Greenbaum, was a, he was a wonderful guy and he saw that I hated this. The night before the final exam for the entire year, he handed me a piece of paper and he said, why don't you study these questions really carefully? You might find that you do well on this exam. <laughs> And I looked at my oh, accounting questions. I couldn't do it. Well, I set the curve in the course on the bottom end <laughs> and uh, on that from that exam. And Dr. Greenbaum was just, uh, he was a wonderful guy because he got together with me afterwards and he said, listen, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you a C in this course for the entire year if you promise me one thing. I said, anything <laughs> so that you will never take another course in accounting <laughs> we're not to forswear ourselves but it was the easiest promise I ever made at any rate I was about to drop out of school at that point that was the end of my second year in university I was close to flunking out anyway you needed a 2.000 average to stay in and I had a 2.004 so I was amazingly on the borderline. I was about to drop out when someone handed me one of the volumes of Sigmund Freud. And I read this. I don't remember which one it was at this time. But I thought, this is fascinating. And I developed a whole new interest and decided that I would stay in university. And I began studying psychology. I began studying course after course, and I, I was not converted at the time. I was not a Christian by any means or any thought or any interest in it whatsoever. never thought about Christianity. 
At that point, I didn't think about Judaism any longer either. But I kept thinking, well, somewhere down the road, the courses are going to get interesting. They're going to deal with real issues. After all, psychology is the, the study of the soul. Suke, Logos, the study of the soul. We're going to be doing that. Well, it never happened in undergraduate, and I applied to graduate school. I shouldn't have gotten in, but once I started studying psychology, I went to a, an A average from a C average, and a couple of the graduate schools were interested in something like that, so I got accepted in a clinical psychology program, and I went through uh, clinical psychology, and I studied specifically one thing. I studied Freudian psychology, and then I went for internships, postdoctoral fellowships, continuing in the study of psychoanalysis. Always, not only studying this, but it's by this point, one of the things you have to do if you're going to teach psychoanalysis, what do you think it would be? If you're going to teach psychoanalysis, you have to do something. What do you think it is? You have to undergo it yourself. So I was undergoing analysis. I was studying it. I was doing work in it. I was beginning to train others in this area. And I remember one day sitting at a staff meeting. I was not on the staff yet. I was in a postdoctoral position. I was later to be named to the staff. There were 212 applicants for one staff position at the medical center and the university. And I got this position. But I got this position after a certain thought came to my mind. I was sitting at the staff meeting. And I remember it was the strangest experience because it hit me. I had no way to deal with it, but here's what hit me. This is utterly meaningless. It's false. It's not true. With psychoanalysis, the idea is that you, you dig deep within and by a process of free association, you come to learn the truth about yourself as your analyst interprets your association. I remember so many situations where people would free associate things. And, you know, you would think, you would, or even you might suggest or talk with other people about it and say, these things weren't true. And yet, we interpreted them as the truth for this person, as though the understanding of these false or non-true memories could really change their life. People would say to me, my supervisors, as if, or later colleagues, as if I was some kind of heretic even at that point, don't you understand? What do you mean true or not true? Or it doesn't matter if it's true, it doesn't matter if they experienced it, or not in reality, this is what they have as a memory. That's all that really matters. Well, don't get into this thing about truth. <laughs> what is that? And I didn't have an answer for it because I didn't think there was. But I knew at least in the conscious realm we did certain things. Those were things we did. We didn't do other things. Those were things we did not do. To suggest that the things we did not do were the same as the things we did do was false. I had no basis for falsehood or truth, but I understood on some level that that was the reality of the situation. By the way, let me just mention something that could help. I, I am a very, very strongly opposed at this point following my conversion and following years of study to psychoanalysis. But let me quote a very well-known Jewish philosopher who put the most telling uh, statement about psychoanalysis. His, his name is Alan Konigsberg. Does anyone know him? Woody Allen? Does that ring a bell? At any rate... Uh, he, he had a movie about 20 years ago. The movie was called Sleeper. It was when he was still making funny movies. And this was, it was a funny movie. In this movie, he had his body frozen. And the idea was that when his disease was cured, he would be unfrozen and he would be uh, able to continue his life. This is the way he would live. He would be frozen until the cure for him was found. Now, when he is unfrozen, he asks, how long have I been in this state? And they said, 200 years. And he reflects it on everything that's 
going on inside of himself as he emerges from this frozen state. And here, here are his immediate words coming out of that. He says, Oh no! If only I did in psychoanalysis for those 200 years, I'd almost be cured now! <laughs> you know, we, we laugh at that, but it's, it's a statement of the paralysis and the dysfunctioning of ourselves and our society that we find that, as I do, funny. Because that is the, the state of, of where we are. So hopeless that we think if only 200 years of some psychotherapy, maybe I'll be better. Now that is the prevailing worldview. Someone feels some distress internally. Go to the psychic expert. The psychic expert exercises his psychic tools and expertise on that person, and that person is as the same as a motor mechanic who works on a car, does something with the circuitry, and the person is better. Now, if that was the case, why would there be close to 1,000 different psychotherapies all disagreeing with each other, and each one claiming to provide some success and some cure? Why would it be that in mental hospitals, the recidivism rate, that means the return rate of people who have supposedly been cured is 86%. You know what that means? That means 86% of the people who come through the psychiatric hospitals go back. Now, there was a very interesting study done in 1972 by a man who was a psychologist and a lawyer and taught at Stanford. The, the Rosenhan study. And some of you may have read it in Science Magazine. Uh, it's been reprinted numerous times, but it was a fascinating study. What he did was to take 12 of his friends. These were professional people, non-professional, people who worked at home, people who worked in the marketplace, and he sent them to 12 different psychiatric hospitals to get admitted. All of them were to go in and have only one thing that's in common they would say. And it was this, empty, I feel empty, or hollow, hollow, inside, hollow. He, I, I think he wanted to resonate with a kind of existential psychosis or something like that. But apart from that, in all their admitting uh, uh, interviews, they were to be completely normal. They were to say exactly what they would say without trying to concoct anything that seemed in any way abnormal. Okay? What did they say? Empty. I feel empty. Or hollow. I feel hollow. All of them got admitted. All 12 of them. The average stay in the hospital was 52 days. Some of them were appointed by him to write in detail their experiences in the psychiatric hospital. They were classified all of them were classified as schizophrenic. All 12 of them received that diagnosis. The ones who took notes were classified as schizophrenic with obsessive compulsive ideational problems to boot. <laughs> because they took notes. <laughs> I've seen, I just see pens dropping everywhere. <laughs> so then they, they're, they're, uh, they're all given medication the psychotropic medication. They didn't take it, of course. They spit it out. They described how the bathrooms were littered with the meds that these patients didn't take. And uh, then the study comes out. And he does a follow-up study. And guess what? In that area of California, the admissions at the psychiatric hospitals dropped 33% in the months following the completion and the publication of his study. <laughs> Why? They said, we started looking at patients as pseudo-patients who were out to trap us. <laughs> Psychology prides itself on being a science. It is not. It is an occult religion. Oh, I don't believe I didn't bring this article uh, that I got from the newspaper from Arizona. The Arizona legislature, both houses of the legislature, because uh, I can't quote it now, both houses of the legislature passed this motion that any psychological or psychiatric testimony on school business 
This was passed by them, given by a psycho psychologist or a psychiatrist in the court. The psychiatrist or psychologist had to wear a wizard suit with a 12-inch pointed hat and a, and a long white beard and carry a wand with it. Really, both houses passed that in Arizona, and it was finally vetoed by the governor. But isn't that interesting? Wizards. Magic. Occult. Really, that's what it is. Now, you see, this is interesting. Psychology today wants to call itself and be declared a science. I was surprised. My daughter graduated from university a few weeks ago. She, one of her majors was psychology. And I, I was very surprised. She got a B.S., a Bachelor of Science in Psychology. I got a B.A. when I, when I finished university. And uh, I was really surprised that it was considered a bad, I mean, that's the... And this was from a Christian college. You know, so I was very surprised that the... Uh, at the way it's been evaluated. But, listen, you see, psychology attempts to emerge as a science when really it's totally reversed on itself. Until the, the mid-1800s, really, I, I believe it attempted to be a science. In Germany, the laboratories were, were set up to quantify and measure and uh, make uh, application based upon measurement. However good or bad those measurements were on certain areas of behavior, um, uh, you know, from, from those laboratories in Leipzig, you have a science. Then you have a step, and it's a, a, a titanic step, because between that realm of things and the next step, which is Sigmund Freud, you have a Herculean leap. It's just, the proportions are beyond comprehension. Freud, interestingly, he's a household name and everyone knows the name Freud. Interestingly, Freud simply wanted to be a researcher. He was interested in research. He wanted to tie everything to biology. But there was no money in that. And if you read a certain book that is a very important book for people who are interested in Freud, it's not written by a Christian. The book is called Freud and the Jewish Mystical Tradition by David Bacon, a practicing psychoanalyst. He was, I don't know if he is at this point, he ties in all of Freudian thought to the occult, to the point, listen to this, to the point. Try and understand, what are the two major presuppositions of, the, the, of Freudian psychology? It's very simple, when you study it, you see it. The two major points are what is known as psychic determinism. That there is a determinism that exists in terms of our thoughts that go on in our minds and the predominance of the unconscious. Those two things. That nothing happens by chance. See, Freudian psychology is completely deterministic. Even from the outset. That's what he says. Psychic determinism. He doesn't say psychic involvement or the necessity of the unconscious. He goes, psychic determinism. Man is, a, is psychically deterministically created, not created, evolved being in terms of Freudian thought. So, this being the case, you would think that a man making decisions would be, who is making decisions in his own school of thought, would be cognizant of his own presuppositions. Now, there are how many days in a year? 365 and a quarter days, right? You would believe that making a major decision, he would be aware of that reality. He begins his psychi psychoanalytic practice on which day of the year? So you already get, you have an idea. It's got to be an important day because I'm presenting it that way. How many important days in a Gentile world? What are the important days of the year? There's Christmas and there's Easter. Freud opens his psychoanalytic practice on Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, of all the days in the year to do this, that's the day that psychoanalysis had its grand opening. So you, you also, when you read Bacon, what you read is that Freud was deeply involved in the occult the Kabbalah and the Gematria. And what you see also is this. I learned this as a technician. 
if someone had said to me as a practitioner of psychoanalytic psychotherapy, if they had said, what are the most important points of psychoanalytic thought? From all the years of study, I would have said Freud dealing with sex and aggression. That's what I would have said. But you know something? They never taught us a whole bunch of things that we needed to know. I don't know if they were aware of them themselves. The most graduate educational programs don't go into this. They specialize in psychology. It specialized in, in clinical psychology in technique. You learned how to do something. You didn't know. You didn't even think. Well, why am I doing this? Does this have a theological point of view? Does this have an anthropology? What are the metaphysical connotations involved in this? Who thought about that? I never even heard of the thought about the term. If someone would have said, what's the anthropology of Freudian theory? I would have said, what do you mean anthropology? You have to sociology. You've got to study sociology and Margaret Mead to, to get into anthropology. I mean, I'm not an anthropologist. I'm a psychologist. Not knowing that I better take a look. Does this guy have a, a, a world view that deals with his perception, his morality of God, of man, of the universe? And he sure did. See, his major contribution was not sex and aggression. That's an application of what his major contribution is. He is the one who stigmatized religion. I think he's one of the most important forces in bringing a stigma against Christianity. His most important books are not his books dealing with the technique of psychoanalysis. His most important books are the future of an illusion. Do you know what that illusion is? Christianity. Um, totem and taboo. Dealing with Judaism. Um, Moses and monotheism again. A civilization and its discontent. These are philosophical and these are religious works. These are the underpinnings for a dramatic deterministic model of man that held sway for over half a century. And I'm convinced the old, one of the few reasons that it, there are several reasons that it's not as predominant today. One of them certainly is feminism and feminism has done much to repudiate Freud's view of women which is denigrating and demeaning. Uh, but the other is this. You know what psychoanalysis, the biggest difficulty with psychoanalysis? The cost. It's approximately $150 for a psychoanalytic hour, and if you're in a real psychoanalysis, you're in three to five times a week. And health insurance policies cover $5,000 or so a year. You've got to be very, very wealthy. Some psychoanalysts for three or four or five years will only see seven or eight patients. Patients, they call them, they're sick. They've got to be sick if they're paying 150 bucks an hour five times a week. I mean, you've got to be crazy to do that. <laughs> But there, there's this determinism that's developed. And then, you see, th this is from the old country. And it, you know, p perhaps had relationships to the experimental psychology that preceded it. So a natural ev evolution into some kind of psychic determinism developed. But in the United States, certainly there was a, a repudiation of this kind of determinism. And so the repudiation of a psychological and psychic determinism was met by another very, very strong force. And that force was behaviorism. Modern, well, it's, it's not modern behaviorism now, but at that point in the early part of the 20th century, you have a man like J.B. Watson, who, was a, who had been a teacher at uh, Harvard University and was fired, and there were reasons that had to do with... Uh, uh, immorality charges. Of course, these things wouldn't be looked at now, but it took place then. He was let go from Harvard. He got involved in advertising. And he had, I think he is some of the most powerful commercials, advertising commercials, can be attributed to, to Watson's work. But, but Watson was getting rid of, he, Watson and later, of course, with the, the real father of what you'd have to call American behaviorism, not the classical conditioning of Watson and, and Pavlov, but of Skinner, the operant conditioning. Skinner, beyond... Li, li, listen, Here, what's his most famous book? Beyond Freedom and Dignity. 
they were, they were radically opposed to the determinism of Freud. But you see, here's what's so fascinating. They just replaced one determinism with another. And you pick which is better. Well, whether you're psychically determined, determined or, as Skinner would say, you're just a, a black box and there are circuits. And we can work those circuits as we please. In, in freedom, beyond freedom and dignity, I said freedom and dignity because that's... He wanted to call it that but was convinced to change it to beyond freedom and dignity. It was a good choice from a publishing and marketing perspective. I think it helped to sell a lot, a lot of books. Millions of copies of that book have been sold. It's the mantra, the, uh, the Bible of uh, the utopian schools of thought, behaviorist utopian schools of thought in, in America today. But uh, he says in Beyond Freedom and Dignity, to man qua man, we heartily say good riddance. Anything of value, hope, meaning, love, these are byproducts of, 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 dry, of the drives of man, the, the biology and the neurology and neurochemistry, and we work on those areas and what we do to um, uh, can direct the course of a person's life. We can work on those circuits by reinforcement contingencies and patterns of reinforcement, and we can make kids and adults do anything we please. You see a, a, an argument or a for all of this, you take a look at the, the movie Clockwork Orange from the early 1970s. It became a cult classic. Of course, though, this rejection <coughs> of determinism <coughs> was not totally acceptable to the free spirit of the American uh, individualistic uh, man. By the way, just let me mention, I thought of a commercial of, of Watson. I remember from growing up, and I think it lasted 20 years, you remember the guy who would walk into town, sit down at the bar, he was a cowboy, and he'd pull out his camels, and first he'd put his feet on the, on the table, and he'd have a big hole in his, his boot, and then he'd, uh, he'd take out a camel, he'd light it up and go, I'd walk a mile for a camel. That's Watson. He knew how to manipulate, and, and a generation of men saw themselves as to be real macho. You had to smoke camels. That's behaviorism. That's conditioning. But that didn't strike the upbeat, optimistic note that American society was in following World War II. And it took another force. You see, I call that the first force, psychoanalysis. The second force, behaviorism. It took another individual of very um, charismatic proportions to, to deal with the void that people experience either in a psychically determined universe or a um, behaviorally determined universe. American people did not want this. And into that void walks a man by the name of Carl Rogers. He says, I reject both. But listen, here's the, before he's rejecting, he's rejecting a whole bunch of things. Growing up in the Midwest as an evangelical, a conservative, listen what happens. And this is triggered during lunch. We were talking about this, uh, the, the, what made up Union Theological Seminary. It's the most liberal seminary, even in those days. And I believe for Rogers, it was in the 1920s, he started his study of theology. He was going to the ministry. I hope the name Carl Rogers, you know, rings somewhat of a bell. He is the most popular psychotherapy in the world. And you know what surprised me? I had an opportunity to lecture at Moscow State University two years ago in their psychology department. And I was brushing up on my Pavlov and trying to talk Pavlov with them. They were going, hey, hey, no, man, no. Carl Rogers. Well, Rogers. <laughs> the Rogers made it into Moscow. <laughs> Moscow State University. It was a, totally a surprise to me, the uh, amount of uh, influence he had there. But Rogers, he, he goes to Union Theological Seminary. He gets the radical liberalism of Union Seminary, 110th Street and Lenox Avenue, New York City. What does he do? He drops out, walks right across the street to Columbia University, into their psychology department, Drops off one hand, drops another, puts another on, and becomes the spokesman 
for the human potential movement. We're going to be dealing with this tomorrow because I want to deal with the whole issue of self-esteem. I think it's so critical to understand the, the human potential movement and its darling child self-esteem along with its self-love, self-absorption, self-realization, self-fulfillment, and what was Maslow's self, come on, actualization, self-actualization. We're going to take a look at this tomorrow because you have to know what these things are saying if you're going to be able to uh, authoritatively and comprehensively answer this worldview with a biblical anthropology and a biblical psychology. Rogers takes his position. You see, what, what is the position of Rogers? What is the therapy of Rogers? He, he avoids the psychic determinism, he avoids behavioral determinism, and he comes up with man in his entirety. See, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong calling it a determinism, but for Rogers, there was nothing else, there was only man. And so what you're dealing with, I see it as a determinism, a anthropological determinism, not a behavioral, but an anthropological determinism, man as the center of all things. So here, here's what he says. He develops a therapy, and you can call it what he does, client-centered, and you see it from his theology. See, there, I've watched him do, do therapy sessions, and it's, it's fascinating, because the person could sit there and go like this. I'm going to kill him, I'm going to kill him, I'm, getting, I'm going out of here, and I'm going to murder that man. I saw a tape of this, and this is... This is, uh, this is Gloria, the ta very famous Roger. This is the one he presents for teaching purposes. I'm going to kill him. I hate him. Roger, you're very angry. <laughs> yes, I I'm going to tear him limb from limb. You're feeling quite enraged. See, the primary principle, technique, in client-centered, the center isn't anything outside of the person. The primary technique is called what? From any of you who have studied Little Rogers? Reflection of feelings. Reflection of feelings. So all you do is reflect. You don't advise. Because once you advise someone, once you say, wait a minute, you're filled with rage. That's sin. Jesus said to, to be angry at a person like that is to commit murder in your heart. You can't do that. That's advising. And Rogers' view is, the person has all the answers within him or herself. I can't bring anything to that person. There is nothing outside of the person. There is no revelation. There is only... You, you see, in some ways it's no different than the behavioral determinism. All there is is you. What you determine and what you decide to do is every bit as good as what someone else might determine to do, even if it's radically different. So it's client-centered, not God-centered, not Bible-centered, not the, the law of God-centered. It is man-centered. It's part of the human potential movement. I mean, when I was in graduate school, when this was crashing on the shores of North American graduate programs, and I rejected it only because I wanted something that went deep. I thought that Freud would go deep. Well, it did. It, you kept going in deeper and deeper, but you, you came up with nothing. There was no answer. You came to see, yes, I hate. Yes, I'm angry. Yes, I am empty. Yes, this is meaningless. But there was nothing to fill the void. You came to see you're, you're alone in a, in a dismal universe. It, it, it only brought despair. And it was ultimately meaningless. There was no answer in it. So there's Rogers providing, attempting to pro provide answers that when we become... Uh, in touch with our feelings that that is going to provide health and wholeness and integrity of ourselves as people. So it spread like wildfire because it's so simple. Any quad can do it. You don't need four, five, six years of graduate training to say to someone who says, I'm in rage, you're angry. But you know, it's funny because in the North... It, it's sort of like holding hands with another person of the opposite sex if you're not married. 
That's what Rogerian therapy is like, and I'll show you what I mean by that. If you start doing that, you're going to want something else, and you're going to get more and more involved. Well, that's what happened to North Americans. They started with this. Let me tell you where it went to. Did any of you ever hear of Esalen Institute? I went to make my pilgrimage there in the 60s. <laughs> that was the hub. That was the center of the human potential movement, where you sat around in pools naked, everyone naked, and touching, feeling, and that's all you were to do. It was to help you get in touch with yourself. Then you'd get out of the pools and you'd have what was known as sensitivity groups. Sensi- sensitivity groups were uh, an excuse for slamming the other person with your own hate and biases and prejudices and leaving them writhing on the floor, a helpless mass if you happen to be more articulate and stronger than this other person. There are many casualties of the human potential movement. Tea groups, marathon groups, nude groups, encounter groups. This is what came out of the human potential movement. Now, I want to just mention another name so you're familiar. There are two names that, and I mentioned it already, but I'll just mention it again. Two names that are tied up with the human potential movement. One is the practitioner, and that is Carl Rogers. The other is the theoretician, and that's Abraham Maslow from the University of Massachusetts. And uh, he wrote the book that became a runaway bestseller uh, toward a psychology of being, where he develops the, the needs and um, of man that starts from the hunger and the physical needs and develop into the need to self-actualize. Those are the two most important individuals. But now I say it was like holding hands, that it had to lead to something. Well, it led to what I would call the fourth force. This was a, a, a school of thought that rejected the determinism of psychoanalysis, behaviorism, and even the human potential movement. It says, why are we limited it ourselves? Is that all we are? We're one with everything. What does that sound like? Eastern thought? That's where it went. Timothy Leary, um, Richard Alpert, who wrote Be Here Now, Now Be Here. I used to carry that around with me along with my um, Narcissus and Goldman and Siddhartha books when I traveled places. Those were, the, those were the volumes that were part of my lifestyle. And these are the things that were changing people's lives. So the East was being brought in for the first time. I mean, I may be wrong in saying the first time, but certainly in an integrated way that was trying to affect the psychological movement of the 20th century. This is in the early, the very late 1960s and the early 1970s. Richard Alpert was a professor along with Timothy Leary at at Harvard. Leary went the route of drugs, and um, Alpert went the route of the East. And he became, he changed his name from Richard Alpert, a uh, New York Jew to uh, Baba Ramda. <laughs> oh, these guys. I hear people just recently still talking about Baba Ramda. He's, from, he's a New York Jew. He's Richard Alpert. He's not Baba Ramda. <laughs> but they were saying that the idea that all is within man is folly. Man is part of everything. So they, they had the, the, so to speak, good fortune of being in the right place at the right time to springboard a whole movement into operation, taking Eastern pantheistic monism on the one hand and Western secular psychology and wedding them together. I, I think when we have the um, full array of what we call New Age books in psychology. You know, shelves and shelves of New Age material in the bookstores. Really, what we are seeing is the end product of this marriage. The marriage of Western psychotherapy and Eastern pantheism coming together. All of these schools try to teach the denial of objective reality. All of these fourth fourth schools, all of these, you might call them New Age, I call them fourth fourth. The, it's a, a kind of cosmic determinism for them. They, they, uh, they say, let's plumb the depths, but let's go beyond ourselves. It doesn't, it doesn't stop here. Um, all that is, is God. If it's not God, then it's illusion. And so, you are God. 
Werner Erhardt, who founded the, the school, very, very popular for a number of years, Erhardt Seminar Training. Another, another New York Jew, Jack Rosenbaum, he took the names of two heroes, put them together, Werner Erhardt becomes the, the leader of a school called, called Est, Erhardt Seminar Training. What does he say? What is the credo of his system? Totally religious. He says, you are God in your own universe. First of all, you are God. Blasphemy and irreverence. In your own universe. You create the universe. It's what you want it to be. And in the universe you create, you're God. He was just the most representative of school after school. I, I can't get into it now, but there, I think there were some people who said there were over 800 different uh, fourth force, I call him, call him fourth force schools. Now, I would want to present to you, very briefly, I'll get into it in, other, in our remaining days, what I would present as an alternative. I would call it this a fifth force. And my commitment is to this force. And it's this. It's the Word of God. I've been doing a sort of history lesson, so I haven't read anything from this today. Uh, but this is, you see, I don't believe that for us, as biblical Christians, the issue is inerrancy. It isn't for the evangelical world as well. The evangelical world will give a lip service to inerrancy. They'll say, yes, we believe the Bible is inerrant. The issue for today is sufficiency. This is where I face my battles. Because people want to say, yes, the Bible is without errors, but it's not sufficient for the complex problems we face today. We need modern psychology to provide the answers. We need to take at least the good things that modern psychology has to say. They're filled with good things. You can't deny that. And then I go, yeah, I, I deny that. They look at me and they say, how can, how can anyone deny that? What kind of a creature are you? Can you not admit? I mean, Carl Rogers speaks about love and the necessity, the priority of love. How can you deny that? And I say, well, wait a minute. But Carl Rogers' definition of love is completely contrary to the biblical definition of love. His definition is a self-absorbed, absolutely unconditional, and the church has come to embrace unconditional love. Just as God loves us unconditionally. But is that true? Does God love everyone unconditionally? What happened to faith? <laughs> what happened to saving faith? Does he unconditionally love all those he cast into hell who reject and deny Jesus Christ? But the psychological world in the church today is saying, Carl Rogers is speaking the truth. He speaks about love. Or old Hobart Maurer is speaking the truth. He speaks about confession of sin. I say, but wait a second. Maurer, who was the past president of the American Psychological Association, his view of sin is completely anthropological. I don't use that word. They wouldn't understand what I'm speaking about. I say, it's man to man. It's a, if I've done something wrong with you to help me feel better, I say, sorry about that. I'm really, really sorry. I might even add, will you forgive me? But sin is not an anthropological concept. It's a theological concept. Against what? The and thee alone have I sinned. That's David. And so the primary focus in confession of sin is not you and me, it is you or me and God. That is not part of the psychological agenda to see and you can go through you can go through any concept you want. When you start from a pool that is absolutely muddied, what you get at the very base of that pool even if it's far from the source, it's going to be muddy. So I'm saying, well, why do I have to go to Rogers for love? Well, Werner Aaron uses the term God. Does that mean he's a believer and we can use something of what he said? I mean, why do we have to go to them? Don't we have this in the scriptures? They say, but, but there is common grace and, and God has graciously revealed psychological truths to these unbelievers just as he has revealed truth in math and science and physics and astronomy. But see, I would respond this way. I say, first of all, if a person is denying the truth of God and rejecting the scriptures as a mathematician, he's not going to be a mathematician speaking the truth as an astronomer. He is not going to understand the nature of the universe. He's going to go into despair because he can't answer what seems to be a vast, limitless universe, black holes, um, universes collapsing upon themselves. He can't answer these questions if he doesn't have a, a starting place in uh, a self-contained triune God, predestinating triune God of history and eternity. He can't do this. Um, so, every area, I don't care what the discipline is. I don't care about the discipline. It has to begin with a, a correct starting point. So, um, if it doesn't, 
you can't, these people can't know truth. You can't even speak about it as truth. So say, and I say, but psychology is very different anyway. Or at least the part that deals with helping people in their souls. Because this book wasn't meant to be an exhaustive book about astronomy. Although the presuppositions of the correct nature and understanding of the universe have to be understood from the scriptures. But it was meant to be a completely sufficient book for what it's dealing with, the nature of man. It begins with the creation of man. It next moves to the fall of man in Genesis 3. And then what is the purpose of the scriptures from Genesis 3 through Revelation 22? What is the purpose? The purpose is what God is going to do for fallen man in restoring him to glory, glory to ever increasing glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18, just as the Lord. What is he going to do? What is he purposed to do in all eternity? And how is that going to be accomplished? And what will that mean for man? That is the purpose of the Bible. Man's redemption and man's restoration in the image and glory of God. So this book is meant to be sufficient, inclusive, exhaustive in terms of the application of the truth of God's word for the healing and restoration of man's soul in Christ. So I repudiate the idea of common grace allowing for us to use the insights of secular men. The church is doing it. I say don't. I say go to the word of God. Learn what the scriptures teach. Hear the word of God in preaching. Let it be applied to your soul through the, through the Holy Spirit's work in your life. I meant to tell you how, some of the movements that happened in my life that brought me to this point. Suffice it to say, I don't have the time. <laughs> so I'm not even going to really start. Because, but I do want to deal with that for a few moments in one of our sessions because the antithesis between the world's view of how we deal with men and the, the view of the scriptures was, came, you know, sort of... Excuse me. Full, full force into my soul as I worked in a secular um, mental health center. I, I will say just this. I mentioned, and I, I, if I have time at another point, I'll deal with this. I mentioned that I was fired at a medical center. I was fired because one of my patients was brought to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why should I get fired for this? Because he was brought to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that was why. This man hadn't spoken for four years. He came to speak. And he came to speak as he saw the scriptures speaking to his problem. And I'll deal with it in, in depth later. I was used as a timid, fearful servant of Christ, afraid for what might happen if I did my job as a believer. But I did my job in spite of my fear. He was converted. And along with him, then another man was converted. And I was given a choice swear that you will never do this kind of stuff again. Now, this is amazing. This man was talking. This man was running around the ward evangelizing doctors, nurses, and patients. No one said, this is a miracle. <laughs> this guy is speaking. They only said, did you hear what this guy is saying? <laughs> and he was saying, you want to know more about it? Ask Dr. Gans. <laughs> He's got the whole scoop. <laughs> I would not promise that. I would not promise that I could would not speak about these things. I couldn't promise that. And so the result was that I was dismissed. I thought my world had come to an end. I didn't know what I could do. I didn't realize that my world had not come to an end, but the door was closed finally on the old man in terms of the way I was living, following the psychological path. And a new door was opening, and it was a door that would lead to ministry and teaching and serving Christ and communicating the truth of the Word of God as all that is necessary and sufficient for the restoration of people's lives. Try and remember this. Don't see the Scriptures as some naive book unable to deal with complex problems. People have existed for 1900 years in terms of the New Covenant community well able to deal with problems and hurts and suffering, modern psychology does not exist to erupt and destroy that whole heritage and that, and that entire and beautiful past. We can, it's not returning to a past, it's returning to the Word of God. And when we do that, then we are going to see churches revitalized, and then we're going to see nations revitalized as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would 
take these things and bring them to the hearts and minds of your people gathered here today. I thank you for them and I thank you for their desire to serve you and to subdue all things for Jesus Christ. May we be on the front lines subduing the lies and heresies of a psychological establishment that is raised up in defiance of Christ. For we pray in his name. Amen. Propaganda. Do you think that there is a legitimate place for the use of antidepressant drugs? And number two, should Christians take them when prescribed? Anybody got an answer? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, did, did you have to start with that one? Uh, I better get up to it. Okay, let me just um, think about this. Um, I don't want to be glib or facile with you on a, on something that I'm sure is seri- a serious question for you. I I am dealing. Uh, I have a book coming out dealing in a great deal of depth with depression and the cognitive and affective reasons that people are depressed. I, I am more and more committed to the reality that it stems from what we think, because the scriptures teach, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so I really want, I don't want to make an absolutistic statement that lumps in biochemical depression where there are true biochemical imbalances and not just thinking things and, and the, the kinds of uh, pharmacological um, remedies that might have some place at some point in the spectrum. I don't want to just make an absolutistic statement. I do want to say that from what I see in dealing with depression, we are dealing with people whose thinking has led to a certain affective response which often then leads to certain behavioral things. One of the reasons in biblical counseling that we haven't maybe been as as effective as we can is because we have striven to capture right behavior. And that's good as far as it goes. But there is more. What I'm working on now is really attempting to subdue and control our thoughts and our emotions. You know, think about this for a minute. Most people believe that their emotional life exists autonomously, that they have no control over what they feel. I don't believe that for one moment, and I don't believe that the scriptures teach that. I I don't want to change what I'm going to be speaking on in these next two days, but I I have a a great deal of information and information uh, material on this that I have been been working on from a scriptural perspective. There was another question with that. Oh, should, I think that believers should be willing to really work on the way they think and to develop the patterns that will facilitate the kind of aspect that is consistent with biblical thinking. Let me give you an example of something for a minute. I just read a book um, by a non-Christian called Fitness Training for Life. I'm into coaching and and coaches. I coach some teams. I I like to learn about how to perform better in terms of running and other areas like that. And this book by, I forget the guy's name right now. I've got it in my notes. He's worked with a number of gold medal, U.S. Olympic gold medal tennis players, and he made an analysis of their of their performance. And he saw that in the top ten U.S. professional tennis players, players, and you can get the book. It's called Fitness Training for Life. He found that there was nothing different in their technique, and he thought, how can there be such dramatic difference? in the overall performance if technically they're no different. So he, he, he struggled in making analysis and here's what he came up with. The problem was not what was happening with the actual technique or the one, uh, one and one loss. 
he found the difference took place when he captured this in between play. Now this may seem very unusual, but in a three hour match, approximately, I think this is a figure, I don't know tennis well enough to remember this exactly, but it's in the book, one hour is tennis play. Two hours is in between the shots. He is convinced that what happens in between the shots, well, what happens in between the shots? He was able, by looking at um, videos of different matches, to predict almost invariably who won and who lost by, by looking at the videos, by watching what they did and how they responded in between the shots. He felt the whole game was won or lost by their what? Attitude. And he, he trained, he made gold medalists out of losers by working on their, what they thought. The scriptures are filled with this. If I take a few minutes at one point, I'll go over some of this with you and show you some, some of the kinds of things that I've seen in the scriptures, how the psalmist, for example, will speak to himself. Um, just a little one on this, Psalm 42, when David is in terrible despair, he comes to a point where he realizes something very interesting. He says, I know I'm going to praise you in the future. Why am I being so stupid as to be in complete despair now? Might as well pr begin praising you now if I'm going to do it later. And by making that cognitive choice, that decision, it affects what? It affects ex precisely what he feels now. He begins praising God in spite of how he feels. Now, here's the thing people would say. That sounds like hypocrisy to me. I mean, if you feel rotten to, to, to act praiseful, no, it's not hypocrisy. Let me ask you something. In the morning when the alarm rings, do you want to get up? Or do you, do you not get up because you don't want to? Some people do. You know where they wind up? In mental hospitals. Really. The people who say, I'm not going to get up because I don't feel like it, wind up destroying their lives, wasting their lives away. You're not a hypocrite if you get up early in the morning because you have to. You're a hypocrite if you get up early in the morning when you have to and you don't want to and you go around telling everyone how much you love getting up in the morning. That's hypocrisy. But it's not hypocrisy to do something you don't want to do. It's obedience, often. So remember those kinds of parameters as you think about that issue of, of taking medication. There are ways to hit the heart of it. Medication often masks. Yes, there's a temporary upsurge. But why do these people need to return again and again and again? Because they're not getting to the heart of it, which I believe has to do with what we're thinking inside. And drugs can often mask that so that we have a temporary mood elevation without a concomitant change in the problem or a resolution to the problem that has caused the depression of the mood so that a person says, I am depressed. And we also live in a culture which people who now, you know, it used to be if someone felt unhappy, what we call depression, other people call it unhappiness. They pulled themselves, what was the expression, by the bootstraps? I think that's the expression. No. They did that <clears throat> and they persevered on. They were made of tougher stuff. Now, people, as soon as they feel a little bad, they, they go to the doctor and they give all the hints so that they can wind up with just a little bit of Prozac. That's all I need. And they get it. We're, we're an addicted society. We feel a little bad. We want something to boost us up. A little drugs, a little booze, a little coke, a little cane. In my case, it's coke. I don't, dr I don't drink this stuff. So when I go driving at night and I have to long ride, I take a little co coke. But it's a Coca-Cola kind, you know, a little caffeine. It's amazing. You know, you know, people say to me, does it really do something to you? It's a drug. It keeps me up. Four hours, I'm flying down the road. <laughs> I mean, it's within the speed limit, of course. <laughs> but, uh, so, I mean, multiply that with the stuff that people use to elevate their moods in, in our culture. Instead of dealing with things. Instead of working through problems. They're looking for immediate fixes. We are immediate gratification-oriented society.